So I guess Rob and I are going to do some a bit like a double act, really, because um, I'm going to start off, first of all, from an academic perspective of how I've gone about applying for CSTAT, what CSTAT means to me, and, uh, and perhaps some uh, tips for a look from what I've learnt along the way about the application process and maintaining it, uh, and some comments about the CPD as well. Um, so I understand there is a mixture of um, academic and industrial statisticians in the audience, but what I will say is do keep listening even if you're not in, in uh, academia because uh, I think a lot of the comments I make will be more general and hopefully I won't steal too many from Rob. Okay, so just to start off with, um, just explain a little bit about my um, career trajectory to date, and then let's, I'll show you how um, RSS and GradStat and CSTAT uh, fit in with that. Um, so first of all, I did um, a four-year undergraduate master's um, called NMORS, which stands for um, Maths, Operational Research, Statistics and Economics. Um, and this is an interesting one because as Trevor was discussing about courses being accredited and at least when I did it, I don't know if it's still the case Sarah, it is now, okay. So I, th I think the issue with this course is because of its flexibility you can pretty much bypass doing any statistics modules. Um, so, so, the, um, so, so there needed to be a sort of double check uh, at that point but, but perhaps that's changed. But anyway, so, so I went on to that once to be an actuary, um, realised that that um, wasn't what interested me and I became a lot more interested in the statistical side of things, specialised more and more in that area, um, particularly in my fourth year of that course. And following that went on to uh, a PhD, so the, the standard pathway for a route into academia. So I moved to Lancaster University and did uh, a PhD in statistics there. Um, I then um, completion of my PhD, moved to the University of Manchester um, as a research associate. Uh, I spent only a year there and then um, through being in the right place at the right time I suppose a, a lectureship came up at Lancaster University and I moved back there um, and then ended up back in Manchester again so I a bit of yo-yoing around uh, over those few years. So uh, back in Manchester again um, in about May 2013, I uh, was uh, offered a, a lectureship again there in, in Manchester. So when they're advertising the next uh, readership or something in uh, Lancaster, perhaps I'll go back there. <laughs> Probably not. So where did um, where does Gradstat and CSTAT fit in for that, just to orientate? Oh, I've, okay, anyway. Um, so I applied for and received Gradstat. I hope I've not got this wrong, Sarah, because I was scratching to remember. Um, in about 2010, so it's kind of a retrospective application, so worth remembering that you know, that's absolutely fine to, to do that if you want to. So I applied uh, for GradStat based on um, the first qualification, so that's important because you can't count things twice, that, that's a key thing. And so you can't count something for GradStat and for the CSTAT, so I'll explain a bit more about that. Um, then in 2014, or perhaps it was the end of 2013, I think I actually applied. So I applied for and, and was um, offered uh, the CSAT, which I've seen in about April 2014. Um, and then um, I, I've just separated it out just to point out that um, I was promoted senior lecturer after CSAT. So just to make two points one, that you don't need to be a, you know, a senior academic to be a CSAT, and, and two, that obviously if I hadn't got CSAT, then I would never have got that promotion. Um, so, Trevor mentioned about the five years experience, um, I think the important thing to remember from if you're on an, an academic track or if you do a PhD, then first of all you can't, if you don't have a sort of statistical undergraduate or master's level qualification, um, then you can't count the PhD both for the educational part and for the experience part. And the other part is, even though it takes uh, three years plus to do a PhD, uh, that, that for only one year towards the five year requirement. Um, I guess we can debate the, the rights and wrongs of that, but um, you know, I think on average that's probably about right. I think it probably depends on the PhD and, and I guess that um, 
that there is some flexibility applied to that. If you have a very deep and narrow theoretical PhD, then that's probably right. If you have a very applied PhD where you're doing lots of things, then um, then yeah, you'll certainly build up a lot of skills over those three years. Okay. Um, this middle point, as I made here, this, this is kind of like the, the, the thing that I really wanted to say. Um, so, so as Trevor was saying, you could say, you know, you could talk about the the um, the um, why, you know, why you wouldn't, why, you know, what what do you gain by not having C stats? And of, and of course, the counter argument to that is well, the opportunity cost of uh, you know, I've got to fill in all this paperwork, I've got to do this CPD, so it's taking me time. Um, the point I wanted to make is, from my perspective as an academic. Um, it's likely that you're already doing many, most, or perhaps even all of the required activities to apply for and maintain CSTAT. Uh, you know, I think w when I came to fill it in, I, I certainly wasn't struggling for things to fill in, to, to drop into the various uh, boxes. Um, so, you know, the only time requirement is the actual process of filling that in. And I'll, I'll talk through some examples of, of some of the things that I at least counted towards uh, my CSTAT. Um, to demonstrate that, hopefully. Um, and, and yeah, and that third bullet, I suppose, is, is the only sort of caveat to that. It's just a case of so being committed to your own personal development, and, and, you know, which um, Trevor Atley roughly described as more or less the definition of being a, a professional, or one part of that, and being, prepared, and being prepared to document it. That's the key thing. Okay. Um, I didn't want to dwell on this, but um, this is... <laughs> I don't know if it is, does it still look like this? Yes, it does. Oh, that's a relief. So I'm, I'm not showing you something completely irrelevant. So this is my form. Um, so, um, or a small part of it. Well, the meat of the actual form, besides the CPD element, is, is what I'm showing you here. So there's lots of, you know, all the usual stuff that you fill in at the beginning. And then the actual meat of it is talking about the experiences that you had um, in your various um, experience periods or employment periods. Or however you might describe those. So I've just put up one particular example here of um, of one of those uh, experience periods. So it's probably a bit difficult to read from the back, but um, just wants to show that you know the actual detail that's required here is from yourself for this part of the form is is you know it's not pages and pages of uh, of material that you have to fill in. So I've given the employer's information here. So this is my role at University of Manchester. And then um, you're asked a series of questions about um, your level of statistical responsibility for a variety of work tasks, um, so which range from, um, so what does it start with, definition of objectives for a project, um, selection of data to be used, choice of analysis methods, responsibility for calculations, i.e. doing the analysis, presentation, interpretation of findings, monitoring follow-up actions. And, um, and there's a variety of drop-down options that you can select from those. And I guess what's being looked for in this application is that in those earlier employment periods, you're having a minor or supported role in these things, and that's progressing through to you having more responsibility. For example, you know, a major role or having sole responsibility for, say, defining the um, statistical objectives or carrying out the data analysis. So, so you know there'd be an expectation that there's a journey there from being a you know a junior statistician who's been supervised and uh, you know being told about what analysis to use uh, through to you're the one that's defining the whole process. Um, you know, however far you can get to it, and I don't think there's an expectation. I mean, on this I've put sold for everyone. I don't think there's an expectation that you need to be there after five years because uh, you know, that, that would just depend on. Um, on where you're working and what the structure is in your organisation. You probably will have sole responsibility um, if you're in a very small organisation, for example. Um, but the main place, of course, that RSS are getting this information for and your competency to back up these things that you're selecting. It's very easy to select sole for everyone, but of course the, RS, uh, uh, the committee are checking this um, using the referees that you specify. So uh, at least two referees, I believe it says. Um, that cover those employment periods that you're, that the whole five years or plus that you're using as your period to demonstrate your competencies for the CSTAT qualification. Um, so obviously pick those referees wisely. Um, that goes without saying, <laughs> as you always would for, you know, whenever uh, specifying referees. 
Um, yeah, so I'll put statistical in brackets. So, that, so, the, so the preference there, um, I'll just remember, I'm, I'm probably stealing some of Sarah's thunder now, but I'm sure she doesn't mind. Um, you know, obviously, these the referees that you specify here, where possible, should be existing holders of CSTAT. Um, if not that, should be um, statistically trained, or if not that, should be at least at a level where they can understand the, you know, your, your level of independence as a statistician and your level of competency as a statistician. By the way, and feel free to interrupt me at any point. <laughs> okay. Um, so this is the other part of the form, and this is the other part of the meeting, and there is what Sarah's going to talk about in some detail. But this again is um, it's just an excerpt of what I submitted for my uh, um, Indeed, it's my CPD summary that I submitted as part of this CSAT application. Um, and you can see the, the titles, the activity description, benefits practice, benefits used. Actually, in this view, it doesn't show which one I've categorised them in. Um, but it just gives a few examples of some of the things I've, I've put on there. Um, these are not necessarily good examples, um, but it got through, but uh, <laughs> this is uh, not um, any kind of gold standard. Um, but just to give some examples, so, so the first one there, the book review, where I said, I reviewed a book called Bayesian Modelling and Bioinformatics. So, uh, so why have I mentioned that? Well it, well, it probably took me more than eight hours to, to read the book and write my review, but I felt that was an appropriate amount of time for all the new methods that I learned. Um, it was also the first book review I'd ever done. Um, so it was good, you know, that was a new experience as well. Uh, so the benefit to my practice is learning those new methods and the benefit to users I've actually been a bit narrow here probably in retrospect. So I said it will help people decide whether to buy the book. So viewing the, the readers of the book review of, um, as the users of that service. But of course any other clients who rely on that, my new knowledge of uh, Bayesian analysis that I gained from that book uh, are also benefiting from that. Um, and then of course there's more classical ones. So the second one down there is what's called the certificate in academic practice, which um, is something that um, everybody will do in some form or other um, as a, an academic. So this essentially is, um, is a course on teaching and learning uh, in academia, so lecturing uh, undergraduates, postgraduates, um, curriculum design and development, all these sorts of things. Um, I put a lot of learning hours there, but that, you know, that was an intense course where I, uh, I, I did learn a lot. I don't know if now, maybe you can't put more than 99.9. <laughs> So, uh, so, so that's uh, an example there. Um, I won't go through all the examples, I'll, I'll, but that, this is more or less, I don't think this was even the extent actually, but that's sort of a coverage of some of the different things that I uh, included in that form. But I know you don't want to read all the, the fine details, so I'll just pull out some of the things that, um, that count towards professional development. Um, so. I know this is recapping things that Trevor said as well, but I think you know it really is important to think about the sorts of things that count. And this comes back to my point that if you're on, in some kind of academic position, whether as a research associate, a teaching assistant, um, a, a knowledge transfer um, associate, you know any of these things, you know a lot of these things, you know you will be doing. So, so new academics program. It's called different things in different universities, but this is the course that you do as a, a new academic. Um, what I've called soft skill training, um, so anything that isn't statistical skill training, um, you know, of course, all that counts as well as Trevor was saying. So, you know, so have a look at in, within your organisation or university. Um, and there's always many of these things on offer, um, and a lot of them are very good and very useful. Um, and of course, statistical tra formal statistical training, um, you know, that's a sort of obvious one that counts really. Um, experiences. Um, so this is where. So I was just having a discussion with Sarah um, before the start of the course, and, and the key thing here is that um, probably where, I put, especially where these comprise a, a new learning experience, I guess, especially should probably be exclusively where these comprise a new learning experience, because you know, as, as an academic, certainly, you know, as you go through your career. Um, we're doing lots of teaching, but that isn't CPD uh, per se. Delivering a lecture course for the per for the first time 
is CPD because then you're learning lots of new things by delivering that course for the first time. So we'll talk through that in more detail. Supervising a student, the same thing. So when you're supervising your 57th uh, PhD student, there's perhaps not so much um, CPD going on there, but when you're supervising your first PhD student or you're supervising your first undergraduate project or MSc project, then there will be learning going on there. And we'll talk about that in a bit more detail. Same goes for you know, your first experiences of line management or any other kind of responsibilities you might have within your organisation, and that's obviously more general outside of academia as well, that um, that, that would be the case. Um, you know, your first experience of line management and perhaps the courses that go along with um, becoming a, a line manager or a leader um, com comprise um, learning experiences. Uh, another example of self-directed learning, so that might be, um, you know, so perhaps um, as, as perhaps somebody, a collaborator has come to you and wants you to do a survival analysis and you've never done survival analysis before, then you need to you know, spend some time reading up on survival analysis. You, know, you might not go to a course, but even if you, you know, take a day and read a book on survival analysis, that's still CPD, that counts. Um, and the same thing for you know, if you're roped into delivering a lecture course about something that you don't know about, which unfortunately does happen. Uh, <laughs> Then clearly in advance of delivering the course, um, you have to uh, actually learn the material yourself. So, yeah, so the other thing that, because um, the thing with filling in these CPD forms successfully is getting the balance right, and um, there's a number of things that um, that certainly don't count, and, and the first one, primarily, doing your day-to-day -day job. So, um, so, you know, so you can't just write down that you spent, you know, forty hours a week on CPD and just by turning up for work and uh, and doing your job. That's that's clearly um, not what CPD is. Um, but I think the, the key criteria to act because you can sort of say, oh, is this CPD? Isn't this CPD? So I think the, the question you have to ask yourself is, did I develop from this? Did I learn anything from, from doing this process? Um, and, and if the answer is yes, then it is CPD. Um, as Trevor discussed, um, the number of learning hours should appropriately reflect the amount of that time you can sort of allocate to CPD. Um, so I'll give a couple of examples to explain what I'm thinking about with this. So here's my example. So giving a lecture course for the second time the total time involved is 200 hours. And by total time there, um, I mean this is the time involved in uh, revising the lecture notes, preparing to give the lectures, actually giving the lectures, dealing with student queries, setting and marking the exam. You know, so everything involved in, in the process of uh, giving a lecture course. So let's say that's 200 hours. So as I say, much of this time will be administrative, um, you know, using the same material as last year, um, run of the mill, let's say, stuff that you haven't in yourself developed from actually doing. However, not all of it, so perhaps you've tried a new mode of delivery, so perhaps you've introduced video lectures or you've, um, you've taken a blended learning approach, so some of the material is, um, is delivered online or, you know, you've added some online multiple choice questions to help the students to, to learn the material. Uh, and you've also, of course, taken on previous feedback and developed the course to address that. So, so what I would do there is I'd say, well, okay, so there's 200 hours there. Clearly, I'm not going to write 200 in my, um, in my CPD form. But what I can do is think, well, you know, there is some proportion of that time that I can attribute, and maybe it's about 5% or 10% or so in that case. So maybe I'll put 10, 10 hours to 20 hours um, as my allocation towards CPD in that case. Okay. Sarah's nodding, so I'm, uh, I'm on track. <laughs> okay, um, a, a different example. So writing your, let's say, 10th paper in, in your research career, or you know, you know, if you're in industry, your 10th report of some kind, or you're involved with your 10th project. 35 hours involved. By now, it's your, this is the tenth time you've been through this process, so you hopefully have a good um, idea of the process. The paper's quite applied. It's your first time collaborating with clinicians. 
Um, so that in itself is, is quite, if anyone ever has um, worked with clinicians, you'll, you'll know that, um, you know that um, there are challenges uh, involved in collaborating with, stati with, uh, <laughs> with statisticians. Yeah, there's probably that too. Um, there, there are uh, challenges involved with collaborating with statisticians, with, uh, with, again, collaborating with clinicians that you have to, um, you know, so in terms of um, getting the message across in a way that the clinicians will understand, and of course they're doing the same in reverse, getting across the the uh, applied problem in a way that you can understand. So that kind of communication is, of course, an experience as well. So some of those 35 hours are going to count towards towards that too. Um, yeah, okay, so your 10th undergraduate exam board probably isn't going to count for anything. Uh, well, anyway, maybe a little bit if something interesting happens. Um, I think the, the point that I'd make with the CPD is that certainly in academia, and I guess the same is the case across the board, it's not an easy distinction. And I can, I can see why this is a difficult area, because you know it really isn't clear. And this, and, and I think this idea of trying to do a sort of honest proportioning of time on the different um, things that you've been involved with is the best is is the only way around this. You're not doing CPD and then not doing CPD. I think everything, or almost everything you do, is in some sense CPD, and it's, it's kind of up to you to determine to what extent what you're doing is CPD, you know, through from, you know, if you're attaining a training course like this one and paying 100% attention, it's all new, that's clearly 100%. If you're giving your 10th undergraduate exam board, then that's close to zero. Everything else is somewhere in between, and the you know, and in some sense, you have to try and allocate correctly um, the learning hours against the total time in the correct pro proportion. At least that's the way I see it. You know, it's a very blurred boundary. You know, we're all you know in academia, and you know, and the same is true in industry. I'm um, just thinking it's perhaps particularly true in academia because the whole time we're meant to be learning new things and you know advancing science. Okay. All right, yeah, so I thought there was another one of these. Sorry, we've got slightly out of order. I do. Sorry about that. But yeah, there's just some other examples of, uh, of things that can count there. So, as I say, the key thing is, you know, it's pretty much everything that you're involved with, but, um, you know, focus on how novel that is in terms of, um, in terms of what you're doing. So, reviewing papers, um, you know, if it's the first paper you've ever reviewed, um, then that's... Uh, that's going to be a lot of learning hours. Um, but I, th I think with reviewing papers, there's always some CPD because you're probably learning um, learning a new interesting area of science or learning how not to write a paper in a, in a new way. So uh, there's always uh, some learning going on when you review a paper. Um, same with grant applications, book reviews, and of course writing a grant application that requires a lot of um, research and thinking and development of yourself but also if you're writing your first grant application and responding to to um, review a feedback on that then the same sort of thing applies you know, it's a new experience then, then um, you know, increase the learning hours accordingly if it's the tenth time that you're doing it then reduce the learning hours uh, accordingly so as I say I since I say it one last time so if you feel you've developed and or, and or learned from it then that counts and it's just a matter of counting the learning hours uh, in an appropriate way. So this is, a, in a way this is a bit more general this slide, so it's like advice for building a portfolio CSTAT, but, but some things from my perspective about um, you know, having a successful career, you know, uh, you know, or, or, you know, or at least sort of making the transition from say being a PhD student into a, an independent researcher. So the thing I haven't mentioned so far is committees. So, um, and I wanted to say this for here because everyone's always getting asked to be on committees. Um, and this is, th this is the only time that I'll be cynical in this. There's lots of committees and I think to some extent you have to be a little bit selfish about how much value there is for you um, being on a particular committee. Um, so, for example, a committee in the RSS, so, so the Young Statisticians section, which I was involved with for a number of years, and Rob was as well, 
Um, that's the kind of committee that um, where you're com you know contributing to a wide um, a wide um, family of uh, statisticians across the UK and across the world. Um, you know you're raising your profile nationally and internationally. Um, so, so that I would say, you know, that's that's a good value um, committee role to take on. Um, we do, of course, have to take on the lower, you know, not lower, but but you know, sort of more local committees. Let's say, um, you know, so we do all have to, you know, sort of take our turn on the, you know, departmental committees and uh, the various different things. But you know, always think about, you know, if, if it's a case of volunteering, then you know, try and volunteer for the committees where you get the best bang for buck. So. Because then when somebody wants you to be on the Health and Safety Committee, if you can say, oh, well, I'm already doing this RSS committee and this um, international committee, then you, know, you might get protected from that. Not that there's anything wrong with Health and Safety <laughs> Committees, so that's an arbitrary example. Um, so teaching, so, so this comes back to the point about you know, what counts as development. You know, this is kind of a, a cart and horse situation that perhaps if if you've delivered a lecture course or you've, you've done any activity and you feel like you've not developed from it, then perhaps the problem is that you've not pushed yourself as, as much as you could have done and you, and, you know, and you could have done something in that teaching, you know, you, you could have done something new, tried something new. Um, you know, so, so that's part of what having this CPD portfolio um, you know, quite appropriately encourages, that if you are um, you know, if you are delivering a course for the tenth time and every time you deliver it in the same way, then you know, try something new and you know, you'll learn from it. Hopefully the course will improve and it counts as uh, CPD then. And more generally, always looking for the next step. So you know, if you're involved in, say, delivering uh, courses, then try and take the next step and say, well, okay, well, you know, you know, can I develop a new course? Can, you know, is there a course that needs rewriting or is there a gap in our in the portfolio of the courses that, that we offer and, and I could then you know develop a, a new course um, so research um, yes yeah, this is quite general but this is just this was in my head while I was writing these slides but um, you know it's I think in research especially as a statistician it's important to get the appropriate acknowledgement for um, for the contributions that you make, and the same will be true, of course, in industry. That you know, if you make a substantial contribution to a project or to a paper, then that should be acknowledged in the appropriate way. Um, so the rule I always use, and I always tell my students to use, is that you, if you ever do the analysis for a paper, any kind of analysis, then you should absolutely be an author on that paper. If you've advised somebody else in how they should do the analysis, and if that was maybe a half-hour appointment, then perhaps an acknowledgement is appropriate. Um, you know, and, and following that through, if you, you know, conscious study design, done the analysis and written the methods and results, then, you know, then you should be in a fairly prominent position uh, in the paper. That's probably nothing to do with, well, it is still to do with CSTAT. Um, you know, just, just something that came to mind as I was writing that. Um, the other thing I did want to mention with research is, you know, there's lots of opportunities out there. Um, in academia as statisticians more so than I think in many other disciplines. Certainly in my experience at University of Manchester and at Lancaster, um, people are always looking for statisticians to be on their uh, grants. So other scientists are desperate for, um, for academic statisticians to be involved with their grant applications at, you know, at any level. So it's, you know, and you know, and if you're not getting those kind of approaches, then you know, ask a senior colleague because you've seen, you know, your colleague is probably turning down countless approaches of this kind. Um, the same goes for reviewing papers. Um, you know, if you're not, if you've not made it onto the map, not onto the scene for being asked to review papers in um, in scientific journals, then again, um, you know, your PhD supervisor, your line manager, um, will no doubt be getting opportunities that they can. You know, would be more than happy to uh, pass on to you in the appropriate way. So it's just a question, sort of putting yourself out there and saying, look, you know, this, I know that this is a gap, and you know, and people are always more than happy to to pass on those things. 
And yeah, I think the bottom one is, is kind of my motto. Do something every day or every week that scares you. Because that's what development's about. It's about just scaring yourself a little bit every now and again. <laughs> so, you know, if you're, fight, if you're afraid of standing up in front of 20 people to give a talk about this, then do it anyway. <laughs> and you'll develop. Um, we've talked about the what and the how, and you know, no doubt plenty of questions to discuss um, over the... Uh, at the end of it the breaks later, but um, why see starting academia? Because I think I think this is quite a challenging question, perhaps more so than industry. Um, you know, why bother? And and uh, a lot of um, academic statisticians do not have C stat. Okay, and, and say, okay, well, I'm a professor. I've got a PhD. You know, that, that's the assurance that I'm a good statistician. Um, and to some extent, that's true. But um, I just wanted to talk through. Uh, from my perspective, what I've seen some of the advantages I have, as and what I've experienced some of the advantages uh, have been. Um, this again picks up on what Trevor said. It, it's kind of a mark of assurance when you're collaborating with other people. And again, that would apply widely, of course. But, um, you know, in a, in a lot of other disciplines, it's, you know, there's an expectation that people in scientific and engineering disciplines have a qualification of this nature. So having it means that you you know, you fit in, and that, you know, and they can understand and and appreciate that you're, you know, qualified to the appropriate level. You know, and, and what does C, and of course, C stat means that you, you know, you have experience as well as qualifications, are committed to personal development, all of these things that we've been talking about. Um, aligns with, so what do I mean by that process aligns and supports existing PDR processes, I mean the ones within your organisation, you know, the, you know this, this isn't, okay, in terms of the form it's a partly separate process but it's, you know, it's all the same stuff that you're counting towards these things of course may help with job applications and promotions, I think it's you know, in, in terms of um, putting yourself forward to the next step, having that there on your CV is useful um, I'm, I'm in the position now where I'm quite often involved in recruitment panels and shortlisting. Um, if I saw CSTAT on a job application, and I was trying to wrap my brain, I don't think I ever have actually. I've seen GradStat. But, <laughs> um, but, um, but, but when you see these, you know, I interpret it as meaning that you can work independently. You've got that track record, you're committed to your development and you can work independently. And as I say, I'd, I'd love to see it on a job application. Um, still never had. Um, currently undervalued and underused potentially in academia um, and this can be changed from the bottom up or the top down so that, you know, and the bottom up being the most likely way that um, you know, the more people that sort of get on, get on board with CSTAT and get the qualification and, um, and maintain it and you know, the more it kind of spreads in that way um, you know, that would be quite an organic way for CSTAT to develop as a qualification that's seen as a um, an important thing. Um, top down, would, so top by top down, I mean the um, one that someone in some position of authority says, right, everyone has to have C stat now. Um, you know, you're not a statistician if you don't have C stat or you're not working towards C stat. Um, I don't know whether that would happen, but um, you know, the, the bottom up seems the more natural and um, uh, approach to me and, and certainly in, in, in terms of other things that often works better rather than things being imposed from the top. Um, and this is similar to what Trevor was saying, although I've missed off um, the company, but uh, perhaps that says something about what it's like working for a university as an academic. Um, so, so as I said, yeah, it's just reinforcing some of the things Trevor said. So, you know, I think that, you know, the, the sort of, the process of going through this encourages you um, you know, to, to engage with your developments. You know, so actually filling in this thing, you know, so even if you're only doing it you know, a few months, if you're thinking, oh, actually, I've not really done much, that can count towards um, my uh, CPD portfolio in for the last few months. It's at least a wake up call to say, you know, I'm, I've got in a bit of a rut, I'm on a bit of a plateau. You know, it's, it's a good opportunity to, um, to wake up and realise that, uh, you know, it's a good idea to take on some new challenges or responsibilities or undertake some development. Uh, writing down all the things you've done is often a positive experience and, and this is, and personally this is something I often find that um, 
I mean, people always moan about the you know PDRs and filling in CPD forms, but I always feel quite good when I do them because I think you know often you think, oh, what have I done? You know, at the end of the day, you think, oh, I spent another day replying to emails, dealing with catastrophes, um, all this sort of thing. You know, I've not really done anything worthwhile today. But actually, when you're taking stock, you know, however often you do this, um, you know, after a few months, you know, when you're taking stock and sort of writing out, okay, I've done this and this is how I developed, I've done this and this is how I developed. But actually, it's it, it's a nice experience, in my opinion, when, when you do it. That you think, well, actually, over the last year, I've achieved quite a lot. Um, so, so I think from that perspective, uh, it's, it's a really good thing to do. Because you know we tend to dwell far too much as you know as, as human beings on the negative side. You know it's it's the problems that we can't solve and the uh, the gaps in our CVs that, that are what's keeping us awake at night. But actually writing down the positives is a really good experience. Um, so I think that's all I wanted to say. Um, I hope many of the points on the summary are, are obvious, certainly the first one, that building towards CSTAT is not some independent activity to everything else that you're doing. Building your career and developing as a statistician is exactly the same thing as um, building towards CSTAT. Um, if it feels like you have to do a lot more PDR um, personal development and CPD than you are doing in order to qualify for, CP, for uh, CSTAT, then that's probably a reflection that um, you should be doing more CPD anyway than you already are, or perhaps that you're doing things that are CPD and you're just not quite recognising that. As I say, it is underused in academia. Um, I think the only way that will change is bottom up. Um, and, but I think with more and more cross-disciplinary work being encouraged in academia, I think it will develop more that way, and it is useful um, recognition amongst other scientists in that respect. And as I say, applying for and maintaining CSTAT is a helpful and positive process for the reasons I've mentioned. It makes you realise that you have actually done something useful uh, with your time. And in my experience, at least, filling in these forms is not... I mean, maybe it feels a bit overwhelming, but really, I don't... You know, from my experience, at least, um, you know, it's certainly less or even quite a bit less than a day, a year of time spent doing this. So, it's, you know, it's a very small proportion of your overall... Um, time spent working that it takes to do this. Um, yeah, that's the end. Um, I'm sorry about this, but I've, um, we, we all had to swear an oath that um, whenever we get any presentation, we have to say, oh, if you all know about RSS, this is another conference in Manchester with more of a health informatics focus, but um, you know, if you need some more CPD opportunities, then, then there we are. Okay.